Hello everyone and welcome back to World of Warships Blitz with Terry. Today we are looking at a, yet again, American heavy cruiser. But uh, this is a premium that has been around for quite a while. And at tier 7 this is the USS Indianapolis. Technically, well, you could almost call her a sister ship of the New Orleans, but of course that's not quite correct because the Portland class was a somewhat slight predecessor design-wise of the New Orleans, but uh, if you're squinting a little, you could say they're very much in the same ballpark design-wise, these ships. Uh, yet another treaty cruiser, and uh, I don't know when this video is going to come out, so <laughs> either I already have explained what the treaty cruiser is, or I am still going to, so either way, uh, I hope uh, you enjoy that particular video, but uh, the USS Indianapolis, there again, as is, is classical with these American cruisers, a lot of stories to tell. But one of them stands out quite a little bit, and that is the loss of the USS Indianapolis, because uh, there's uh, that did, things did not go quite well, and the US Navy has not covered itself in glory in that particular episode. So what happened was that uh, the US was getting ready to drop uh, a nuclear bomb or two on Japan to force them to, to, to surrender if they didn't do so voluntarily. And the Indianapolis was the ship that carried uh, some of the parts, especially including the enriched uranium, uh, all the way over into the Pacific, because she was known to be a pretty fast ship and as such uh, was carrying that cargo on a secret mission. Then after dropping that off, uh, she made her way over, uh, over towards the Philippines in order to join the rest of the American fleet. On that journey, she was torpedoed by a Japanese submarine. Uh, she was hit by two torpedoes. The ship wasn't, uh, they weren't able to, uh, to save the ship and uh, she sunk and about uh, 600 sailors or sorry, I think about 900 sailors. I'll have to double check. Uh, went into the ocean. They didn't have enough lifeboats or anything of that sort. And uh, while they were able to, to radio, to radio the, in the emergency, it turned out that nobody came to rescue them. Three days later, three days later, uh, whoever was left at the time and hadn't yet either died from starvation, salt po poisoning or sharks, uh, was found by, by accident by a Catalina that was an anti-submarine patrol. And the pilot of that Catalina actually set the, uh, set the plane down and uh, collected as many of the survivors as they could just to get them out of the water while radioing for help and a destroyer eventually, eventually arrived. So after that, and uh, there were not many that survived, uh, after that, uh, the captain of the Indianapolis, Captain McVeigh, was actually court-martialed, un unjustifiably so, uh, because he was accused of not giving order to abandon ship, which was untrue, and of endangering the ship for not zigzagging. And despite the fact that the captain of the Japanese, Japanese submarine who sunk the Indianapolis after the war said even if he had zigzagged, uh, that wouldn't have changed anything, the thing was up, upheld and uh, Captain McVeigh eventually, after years and years of, of receiving threats from the, survive, the families of the survivors, committed suicide in the 1970s. And it wasn't until the 1990s, I think, that his name was eventually cleared when it was investigated and found that no, he actually did not do anything wrong. So why was the Indianapolis not uh, sent was not why wasn't there any help sent when the ship was going down well it turned out that their emergency signal had been received by three stations but one of this uh, one of the radio operators was dead drunk and uh, another one of them uh, eventually uh, uh, another one of them decided it was a japanese uh, a japanese trick and the the operators in the port over in the philippines who knew that uh, the Indianapolis was supposed to be coming and hadn't arrived on time, didn't uh, choose not to do really anything about it and uh, just more or less ignore the whole affair and move on with their things. So a lot of failure on the side of the Navy and uh, it sounds a bit like they were trying to lay the blame for this on the captain instead of, you know, <laughs> making questions about poor decision making. So. Uh, 
If you've watched the Steven Spielberg movie Jaws, you might be aware of, uh, of one scene towards the end where the shark hunter retells the harrowing story of how sharks attacked the survivors of the USS Indianapolis. And uh, that story was mostly uh, due to true, true events and actually managed to, to, show, to shed some light and raise some interest about this particular part of history. In all, all in all, it's a, a relatively tragic ship. But uh, let's get back to let's get back to uh, to events in game. So Indianapolis, a very old premium. Uh, let's begin by doing the obvious comparison and comparing her to the New Orleans. And uh, the Indianapolis actually gets radar. So uh, that at tier seven at the time, I think she was one of the first ships to actually have radar. I uh, can't remember if there was anything before the Indianapolis that had radar at the time, but uh, it certainly wasn't common and most certainly not around this tier. So for destroyers, this was a bit of an issue. And uh, I'm pretty sure she also predates the light cruisers. So uh, with, with a rapid reload and two charges of radar, which have a 7.2 kilometer range, uh, she could be a little bit of a menace for things that were used to sitting in smokescreen un, uh, unmolested. The hull is pretty much the same. The maneuverability round about the same as well. It's not a huge difference to the New Orleans. The guns are all in all, uh, while they are called Mark 14s here and technically have a 55 caliber length, they do feel very much like the New Orleans' guns. And they do have, they do get a very slightly longer range. But other than that, the armor piercing here is still not quite as capable as you'll find in later heavy cruisers. Uh, the reload is the same, the damage is the same, everything else is the same. Uh, the same goes for the secondaries, and the same goes for the anti-air. The difference being, uh, the New Orleans already has been power crept in terms of AA because this is tier seven, <laughs> and. Uh, the Indianapolis doesn't get the defensive AA skill. So this is an American cruiser where you're actually pretty unsuited towards dealing with enemy aircraft. And uh, that's some, something that uh, is easy to forget if you're used to playing American cruisers, uh, because you have to sort of resist the urge to go for enemy aircraft, because in this thing, you're not so much capable of doing anything about it. The concealment is a little bit better, but other than that, it's pretty much a premium New Orleans with uh, with radar instead of the defensive AA skill. Which brings us to the setup. Now, uh, you can choose between a couple more hit points, large caliber AA damage, which given that you don't have an awful lot of it and you're definitely not an, a dedicated AA ship and you no, have no way of stacking it using the defensive AA skill, uh, feels like a little bit of a waste, so going for main battery reload is not a terrible idea. These turrets are not great. I would not recommend using the <laughs> uh, using the main battery mod 2. Instead, I'm going to go for turret rotation uh, because these are, just like the New Orleans, uh, for a heavy cruiser, she is actually quite maneuverable. Now, don't let the heavy in heavy cruiser deceive you. Uh, if I haven't managed to put out the <laughs> video yet, uh, these are heavy cruisers only by later designation in the 1930s due to the caliber of their guns. Very much not so due to the amount of armor plating that they carry. So while she's not quite as squishy as a Pensacola, uh, which is not, it's not a grand feat not to be as squishy as the Pensacola, and uh, you're going to be hit and hurt by any kind of shell fire coming in. So uh, main battery mod 1 it is, and other than that, uh, the completely regular setup. You could consider concealment, possibly, and that's probably that, that is not a terrible choice. I, I personally like the steering gear mod because I always feel that concealment gets me into position early game, but then it sort of loses its effectiveness pretty quickly because I'm not going to stop shooting. <laughs> and that's just me. But if you like to disengage, relocate, and then start out again, play more of an ambush sort of style rather than an ag aggressive gunboating style, then concealment would actually be the better choice because these ships are quite maneuverable as they are. So the, uh, the steering gear mod is not necessarily a massive necessity here. And the concealment is pretty decent to begin with. I have, as usual, been playing with two setups, a 
standard setup with just uh, with just a regular captain and a fully maxed out if you put all the money available uh, all the things money can buy into the ship which gives us the historical camouflage uh, which gives us large caliber aa range which is quite useless on the ship to be honest i would have much much preferred dispersion here and torpedo damage reduction which is also quite useful uh, qu quite useless so the hit points and the firing range are neat, but I think this is not a must-have historical camo. So if, you, if you're if you on the fence here and you feel like, oh, maybe I shouldn't, I, I have another ship that I want to spend the gold on, then uh, this is definitely not a must-have in my opinion. It's, it's a nice one and it looks decent. <laughs> like it looks very pretty. But uh, other than that, from, from the stats, it's not a massive boost to things where, where it actually counts. The first battle, like I said, regular commander. The second one I have played with Kincaid. And uh, there, there's a good reason for that, because uh, Kincaid gives, has, the, has a specific battlefield support skill, which gives an additional radar, which means with this, uh, the Indianapolis actually has three radars. Now, if she had a defensive AA, that would be great. And I think that would actually be a really good change to make to this ship, to, to give her maybe a def AA1 and bump the New Orleans to a def AA2 for tier 7, given what you kind of carry as you're going to start encountering in tier 7, uh, that would actually be a really nice change to make if there was a decision to very slightly uh, update these ships that have been somewhat power crept. Uh, other than that, um, yes, I, I have the def AA skill here, but that's because I'm, I'm just bringing him over from the New Orleans. And uh, we obviously want the Master Reloader and uh, the Armor Piercing Cap Shell, which gives us better, uh, better firepower against cruisers and battleships at close range, or if we are targeting weak spots. And again, these guns are not quite as punchy that you run into problems like with German guns, that against enemy destroyers you just overpenetrate everywhere. But with armor piercing cap shell, you do have to switch to high explosive at about six kilometers. Otherwise, you start over penetrating quite a bit. Without it, you can potentially get a little bit closer. But still, I would usually get, you know, keep that as a ballpark figure. Let's saying five to six kilometers is when you want to switch to HE against destroyers, because otherwise you start over penetrating. But you'll see it. You know, it's the lower numbers. If you're not doing any damage, then you got to switch. All right, so two battles, first game, uh, regular setup, uh, second game fully decked out, and uh, we'll see how well this very, very old premium cruiser is going to hold up. The first round sees us in center control cage on a tier eight game against the Shukaku, Prince Heinrich, King George, Cleveland, Kagero, Mahan, and Akatsuki. Uh, yeah, so uh, enemy carrier spotted. I'm in an American cruiser. First, first reaction must go and chase planes. Not a great idea in this thing, <laughs> but uh, you'll see what I mean. Anyway, uh, that's an instinct you're going to have to fight. But uh, as is common with the American heavy cruiser starting at tier seven, uh, the bow in and island waifu gameplay is <laughs> is is the is the way to go. So just uh, I'm just instinctively moving towards the rest of my team in order to get under the airplanes. But um, you, you want to stick close to islands. You want to uh, you want to be bow in and use your forward turrets as, po as much as possible unless there's an, op uh, there's an option to play out in the open. Uh, there comes the enemy Shukaku. I'm giving some, well, I'm thinking of giving air cover to the, uh, to the Kagero, but uh, then I realize, oops, I'm in Indianapolis. <laughs> I can't actually. <laughs> I mean, you shoot the occasional plane down, um, but uh, le let's get ourselves away from these from these torpedo bombers and see where the torpedo strike is going. He doesn't go after the Kagero, so uh, comes in in the center. So we are going to slow right down. Nope, he's going after the Fiji by, all, by of all ships, which does have some decent AA, but uh, was probably the more inciting target. But now I'm I'm inside the capture circle, and uh, there is a Mahan or Mahan. I'm still not sure. So let's unload at that thing, rapid reload up, six kilometer range, still good with the armor piercing. And I am trying to get all my guns on target. Now he smokes up and that's not going to help you, Sunshine, because you're within 7.5 kilometers range of my radar. <laughs> and you're not used to having radar at tier seven, I can tell. <laughs> so uh, that is an extremely dead mayhem. <laughs> There come some shots in, I think, from the Fiji. Let's see if we can clip his t his tail still, lobbing it over the island, and he's gone. So, yeah, 
with with a radar cruiser in the ow, <laughs> not, that was probably the King George. Uh, with a radar cruiser in in the game, you do not want to you do not want to uh, uh, to do that. Those sort of shenanigans. Okay, enemy Cleveland, which is obviously a threat. Okay, we've lost our own Benson. <laughs> I was about to say, which is a threat to our destroyers, which uh, by the way have absolutely no interest in the capture circle as usual. Uh, let's let's see if we can deal with the Cleveland, and hopefully that can enable the um, that can enable the the destroyers to get back into the capture circle. Carrier has the same idea. Cleveland actually has very good AA, so that is quite brave of the carrier to to send a pl send the plane straight into into a Cleveland. Okay, Kagero spotted. I think Cleveland is about to die, so uh, let's begin by shooting at the Kagero. Is he going half speed? I'm not sure. It's a little bit faster than that. Uh, taking fire from the Prince Heinrich, uh, Cleveland is going to burn. It's going to burn down. There she goes. And uh, I am coming under air attack, but uh, Kagero unfortunately has gone unspotted. My radar is on cooldown. Uh, Fiji, there's a Kagero over there. I, I've, I've literally there, there. There he is. That, that's where the torpedoes are going to come from. I was like, ah, no problem. <laughs> I shall fear no torpedoes. <laughs> Full steam ahead and damn the torpedoes. And I think Fiji's gonna take two. Yep. <laughs> oh well, I did warn you. Okay, Gargero spotted again. And uh, but unfortunately he is at just outside my radar range. If he smokes up now, I'm gonna try and uh, go forward and keep him within range. Let's see what we can finish off the Kagero. Unfortunately, I have again forgotten that uh, the carrier is there <laughs> and that I am not in a cruiser that can defend itself, especially not against the tier 8 carrier. But we have finished off the Kagero. Now, unfortunately, we are um, in a bit of a sandwich between the King George and the Prince Heinrich on the other side. And, uh, and the carrier is coming as well. So I, I may have poked my nose out a little bit too much. <laughs> and yeah, the Prince Heinrich is finishing the job here. But we've defended that capture circle, uh, taken down two destroyers and uh, shot down while well, five airplanes. <laughs> Woohoo! While under constant air attack. Uh, okay, so all team, all you need to do now is is not lose the capture circle. And given that, uh, okay, Fiji, that's a prince, uh, uh, th that's a King George. Yeah, you, you don't want to be broadsiding to that thing, especially on your amount of hit points. And there's an Akatsuki. Fiji, that's an Akatsuki. Do you have smoke ready? No, no, don't broadside the King George. No, <laughs> that's a terrible idea. Okay, anyway, Fiji is dead. But he did get his torpedoes away, which, which is not going to help him because the King George is already dead. Uh, the Hornet fig uh, dis wanted for a moment to get into the capture circle, but decided that, um, yeah, nah, no. <laughs> Not not with my cruiser support dead. I'm not gonna. So Hornet is wisely backing off here. Uh, friendly Kagero is coming in from whatever business he was having outside the capture circle, and uh, uh, the Hornet's fighters are chasing down uh, chasing down enemy planes. And we have an Akizuki, which would be very very useful inside a it's a capture circle, but decides that he wants to get into a close range gun duel with the Prince Heinrich. I mean, this is an Akizuki. He, he can, you, you can burn down a Prince Heinrich without too much trouble, but you probably shouldn't give it broadside. <laughs> that, that I would not recommend, because if, if the Prince Heinrich is smart and loads the high explosive on the main guns and the armor piercing on the secondaries, uh, that is not going to end well. Uh, also, you're going to be coming under, under air attack now. Oh, Akizuki wanted to get his torpedoes away. Well, Prince Heinrich has sonar, right? <laughs> not sure that is going to work too well. Uh, Prince Heinrich is not on fire, but uh, has noticed that the torpedoes are coming and is going to avoid at least most of them. Uh, that said, uh, the Akizuki has managed to land two torpedoes in him. And while he's now dead due to not having paid attention to the Shukaku, uh, I think he may have taken down the Prince Heinrich. I'm not sure. Um, actually, it was the Kagero that sunk him. Yeah, I think he took down the Prince Heinrich, which means uh, that Shokako is now completely alone. And the Hornet has recaptured the capture circle. <laughs> well done, Hornet. <laughs> um, and now it's just a matter of uh, Kagero. Uh, Kagero smokes up. That's not a terrible idea. Um, especially that as a Japanese, uh, a Japanese carrier and the... Uh, the dive okay Hornet where are you dropping the uh, the dive bombers are not particularly effective but um, uh, the torpedo bombers are the ones that you really want to want to worry about so 
uh, Hornet's been shooting down, shooting down things, but it's now got his fighters captured over the Shokaku, so that these fighters are probably going to die. Uh, Shokaku, in 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 the excitement, has missed the Kagero. <laughs> I can understand that. I, I can't manage to do two things at the same time either. <laughs> I mean, he's lost the game anyway. He would have to kill both carriers and uh, both the carrier and and the Kagero, and that's not happening. So, uh, well played to that enemy Shokaku. And uh, yeah, if you're in, in, in the Indianapolis, you really do not want to go after aircraft. You're not having a great amount of firepower when it comes to those. Uh, Kagero goes after the carrier, and that's fair enough because we've already won at this point, so he might as well try. But uh, there we go, and it was, the after all, the Akizuki, uh, who, has, who, who had no interest in the capture circle whatsoever, <laughs> but uh, has done enough damage to come out on top of the team. And uh, that's also fine because our team was holding the capture circle for most of the game, so there's really no need to actually be in it if your team is holding it. So, uh, well done everybody, and uh, well played Hornet. And in round number two, this time with a fully decked out Indianapolis, we are facing a Parzival double Anhalt. Uh, these could be loners at this point, although not the second one because he's, he's got a special camo. Uh, Colorado, Gneisenau, and a Kutuzov. No destroyers. And it's a 6v6 domination on Aurora. Aurora is relatively open. There is one island position that you can take, depending on where we're spawning. Uh, we'll see if we can make ourselves useful in that position in a defensive corner, or if we have to open water. And that'll be a... Uh, okay, no, we, we're, not spawning on the, uh, we're not spawning on the western end, so no island play for me. And we're going to try and challenge C Cup. Now this is a bit of a different different gameplay because uh, I'm faced with mostly battleships. I've got a Roma with me. Roma is extremely powerful. So I'm not going to rush ahead. I'm just going to stick with the Roma. And uh, I'm just going to make myself as useful as I potentially can. But if you are in a situation like this and you don't have any destroyers to chase and you don't have any smokes to negate with your radar, uh, and there's a tier 8 carrier around, and you're in, a, in an American cruiser which does not have the world's greatest AA, uh, what you probably want to do is just stick with your teammates, uh, let the battleships tank for you, and uh, get the enemy battleships to waste their shots, and, you know, uh, make yourself useful, but not be in the front row, necessarily. So uh, there, there is, I think, the enemy Kuchizov, who has not gotten that... Uh, oh, no, it's a bot witcher. Okay, never mind. The bots, the bots, just, bots, bot, bots are going to bot. <laughs> He's just going to rush straight ahead into the Luca Tarigo, who, who has to kill that Wichita, because these things are extremely dangerous for destroyers, because A, they get destroyers spotted, uh, and they can negate your smoke, and uh, they can blap you in the side. So uh, Wichita is dead, but the Tarigo has lost about half his hit points on doing that, and there's the enemy Anhalt. So um, uh, I don't want to be the first one to be to, for the Anhalt to shoot at. I'm going to give him the Roma to shoot at. Roma can tank. And I have switched to high explosive here. And it's going to see if I can set some fires. And uh, yeah, Anhalt is shooting at the Roma. So there's no need for me to go defensive. And uh, that, that's what the Roma is for. He's got the health and the armor to tank that thing. So uh, not a massive issue. But now I'm getting close enough that I can start switching armor piercing and getting the rapid reload in and uh, just just go for the damage because we're not, we don't need to go for damage over time. Uh, I'm trying to go for some deck shots here at this range against the Anhalt. And uh, he's still shooting at Roma. So we'll, let's see if we can make something happen through the deck armor and go for a Citadel maybe. But um, well, no luck so far. And the, still the more reliable shots are going to be into the into the stern. Now the Anhalt does have torpedoes. These are just his auto secondaries. Yeah, he's fully focused on the Roma. So I'm, I'm in no danger here, but still I'm going to go bow in just in case. <laughs> because he can, at this range, he can do some nasty stuff. But yeah. Uh, deck armor at close range or bow stern with uh, APCS is, uh, you are going to do a fair amount of damage. Okay, enemy Gneisen now spotted over there. But uh, my team is sort of lemming trained, and uh, whatever we had over in A cup has died. So the enemy team is going to grab A cup, and uh, is going to threaten the carrier position, who hasn't moved the whole game. I'm not sure if that nice now is AFK. He may be AFK. So uh, let's let's head over into B cup and start defending B cup. No, no, I think he's moving. Uh, B cup is under threat from the Kutuzov. Now, if you're in a Kutuzov, uh, you yes, I understand why you want why you want to take the capture circle, but uh, if you're faced by a heavy cruiser with rapid reload, 
Um, you are not in a good position. Now, Kutuzov does have relatively decent torpedoes, but I don't think they have an 8 kilometer range, so it should be relatively safe here. And yes, Kutuzov has realized that he does not want to be here, he's drawing too much attention, and he wants to be elsewhere. So he's sailing away, but coming under carrier attack, and it was actually the Amagi taking him out. Uh, not before he sets a second fire, triggering my Damacon, but now I can retake B Cup. But uh, now I'm taking point, and taking point is not something you want to do in an American heavy cruiser, especially not broadside. So you want to be bowing, just like this, and in reverse, and get the battleships to waste your, your salvos on you until the friendly battleships, like that, until the friendly battleships have caught up, or until the enemy battleships are growing tired of splashing shells into the water, and uh, actually end up targeting someone else. And that's the point when you can make your move again. So, have you gotten tired yet? There's an Anhalt and a Colorado. I mean, they've done pretty much everything right. Okay, they seem to have gotten tired, and I seem not to be uh, not to be setting any fires on the Anhalt, which is a little surprising. So um, we're going to switch to the armor piercing and trying to get a little closer. I can't. Of course, the moment I switch to the armor piercing, I get a double fire. <laughs> All right, so one AP salvo while the Damacon is active, and then we're going back to the HE. But uh, given that these guys um, are now no longer interested in shooting at me because they found something else that was a little closer, let's enable the rapid reload and try to get some perma fires going on the Anhalt. And the carrier has been paying attention and is going for the perma flood, but it's not happening. Lucky Anhalt there, that should have been one. Uh, there is a Colorado, but where is that Colorado looking? Is he looking at me? No, he's not looking at me at all. Perfect. So let's uh, let's let's sail around the other side of the Colorado while they're all trying to kick whatever that was, Roma probably, to death. And that's a double perma on the Anhalt. So now I can I can start uh, doing maybe one more HE salvo and then we'll switch. So one more HE salvo at the Anhalt. Uh, just yep, triple perma fire. Perfect. And now uh, armor piercing against Colorado at point blank. So let's make let's go for manual aim on the deck plating. And uh, yeah, that's that's where the damage comes in. Burned down the Anhalt. Uh, Roma is still alive, and uh, Colo is in a brawl with the Colorado now. But the Colorado is completely busy elsewhere, so I can I can go for some superstructure shots, and uh, under 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 that fire, the Colorado succumbs, and that is the end of the game. And we've done seventy thousand points of damage without uh, taking too much fire in return. So if you if the situation allows you to do this sort of play and you don't have any destroyers to chase, because you don't really have an, an awful lot of support value outside of that, because you're a, you don't have a defensive AA. Uh, if there's nothing that you need to radar, just hang back um, and uh, help your friendly battleships with things. And it, is, it looks like the Gneisen now has been AFK after all. Anyway, the USS Annap uh, Indianapolis, uh, she's been around for a long time. It's still good to have a, to have a radar cruiser at, at tier seven. And uh, you can occasionally do some nasty things to like an unsuspecting Belfast <laughs> or similar. But uh, she has been power crept a little bit, especially if you're in a bottom t if you're bottom tier and you're facing tier eight carriers. Uh, just remember that these things can't take uh, can't take any any airdrops or cannot defend themselves against airdrops and are better suited towards the role of assault cruisers than support cruisers. And uh, that's it for me today. Thanks everybody. And I will see you next time. Bye-bye.